Hello, my students. In this video, we are going to discuss lecture five, which will be the beginning of a new chapter. However, before we start to discuss chapter six, uh, it's very useful this slide. This slide in which we are going to discuss the classified balance sheet. Uh, as you know, classified balance sheet will classify assets into short-term assets and long-term assets and liabilities into short-term or current liabilities and long-term or non-current liabilities. For the assets part, we already discussed chapter uh, 10, which is related to the plant assets, natural resources, and intangible assets, and that was uh, the non-current assets. And then we started to uh, go for the current assets in which we discussed so far the receivables, which was the last chapter. And today we are going to discuss inventory, which is part of the current assets. In this chapter, uh, exactly, we are going to identify these uh, three learning objectives. First, we will discuss together the items making up merchandise inventory. Then, how can we determine the cost of merchandise inventory? And finally, in this lecture, how to calculate the cost of inventory under perpetual system using the four methods of specific identification, FIFO, LIFO, and weighted average. For the first uh, learning objective in this lecture is how to identify the cost of merchandise inventory. However, before discussing the first learning objective, it's very uh, useful first to define what is inventory. Inventory is simply the goods uh, and the material that a business will own and that will get from a wholesaler, retailer or distributor and then we'll keep it at his place and then we'll sell it later for the customer for a higher pr price. Those inventory can see it can be simply electronics, uh, clothes, car uh, and any other uh, goods that a, a business or a company keep and then sell later for a higher price. So if we take uh, for instance Carrefour, uh, Carrefour uh, is uh, its inventory uh, can be uh, the Pepsi cans, bear, the milk, the juice, the On this slide, we need to determine the cost of an inventory. The cost of an inventory is like uh, the cost of any, any other asset. In order to determine its cost, we need to include its uh, purchase price, or what we call here invoice cost, plus the any other cost that the company will need to pay in order to make this asset ready for use, which include uh, shipping cost, storage cost, insurance cost, and of course we need to deduct from the invoice cost the discount and allowances. On this exercise we are going to learn to determine the items that should be included in the cost of an inventory. So let us discuss it. A car dealer acquires a used car for $14,000 with terms FOP shipping point. Additional costs in obtaining and offering the car for sale include $250 for transportation in, $300 for insurance during shipment, $900 for import duties, $150 for advertising campaign to promote for the car, and finally $1,250 for sales staff salaries. You are required to determine the items that should be included in the cost of the car. As we agreed before, in order to determine the cost of an inventory, you have to include two items. The first item is the purchase price, which is the bulk. And the second item is any other expense other than the purchase price, which is necessary to bring this asset here and to make this asset ready for use. So to apply this, first we have the 14,000, which represent the purchase price. So the first item that we're going to include will be the purchase price. Of course, don't forget that if you have in the exercise the purchase discount, then you should subtract the value of the purchase discount from the cost of the car. But here we don't have the purchase discount. Then, after that, you should consider the following expenses and analyze them. Are they necessary to bring this asset to a state that's ready for use or not? So let us start. You have $250 for transportation in. This is necessary to bring the car from abroad to the car dealer store so those 250 is necessary so we're going to include the 250 as part of the cost of the car then 
uh, the car dealer will have to spend $300 for insurance during shipment because in order to ensure that the car will reach to its destination, the car dealer, which is the buyer, will have to ensure to pay insurance cost. So those 300 is also necessary. So we're going to include them. $900 for import duties. Import duties is a type of taxes that's paid on any imported good. So taxes is necessary because if the buyer will not pay for those taxes, the good will not enter the country. So those 900 is also necessary. Then we have $150 for advertising campaign to promote for the car. Now, those $150 are not necessary because they are considered as advertising expense in order to sell the car. So, those advertising expense is not necessary, meaning that the car can be used without any advertising campaign. So, we will not include those $150 as part of the cost of the car. And finally, we have $1,250 for sales staff salary. So, those represents like a commission that the car dealer will have to pay for the employees in order to promote for the car. So they are treated as well like advertising expense. If the car dealer will not pay those advertising expense, this will not make the car used. No, the car can be used without paying those sales staff salary. So those 1,250 are also not necessary to make the car ready for use. So accordingly, we now can uh, calculate all these four items together to get the total inventory cost which was, will be fifteen thousand dollars and four hundred fifty that's the first learning objective in this lecture which is to identify the items making up merchandise inventory before we go to that we need first to define what is inventory Inventory is uh, one of the types of the current assets, and by current assets, I mean uh, a short-term asset that will stay in the company and will be sold within a short period of time, which is a maximum one year. So this is a current assets, which is the inventory part of it. So we need now to know what is the items that uh, will make up the inventory. So we need to uh, visit this definition in order to uh, exactly know what are the items that are making up the inventory. We said that merchandise inventory, it includes all the goods that company owns and holds for sale, regardless of where the goods are located when inventory is counted. This will take us to three types of inventory that we need to consider. The first one is goods in transit, the second one is goods and consignment, and the third one is damaged goods or obsolete or spoiled goods. So let us discuss the first type of goods in transit. The definition of goods in transit are those goods that I am as a store ordered them from abroad and I'm waiting for them to reach to my store. So they are goods on their way to the owner. We need to determine uh, the ownership of these goods belong to whom, to the buyer or to the seller. In order to determine the ownership, we need to review the shipping terms. If you remember, we discussed before the shipping terms, we said that we have two shipping terms that are agreed upon between the buyer and seller, which is the first one is FOB destination and FOB shipping point. If you are talking about FOB shipping point, then uh, this means that the buyer and seller agreed that once the goods are released from the seller place uh, and reached to the shipping point, these goods now belong to the buyer and not the seller. So let us take an example. If you are talking about Zara factory at Spain and Zara store here in Egypt at Cairo Festival City. So. Uh, Zara store here in Cairo Festival City at Egypt made an order to uh, uh, bring some inventory. Uh, those inventory, those goods will be sent from Zara Spain, Zara's factory Spain. So uh, if the agreement between Zara's store in Egypt and Zara's factory at Spain is based on FOB shipping point, it means that once the goods are released from Zara's factory at Spain, 
at that point it now belonged to Zara's store in Egypt it's owned by Zara's store in Egypt even if those goods still didn't reach to Zara's store in Egypt it belongs to Zara's Egypt store so Zara's Egypt store can now include those ordered goods among his inventory count this is because the agreement is FOP shipping point so let's take the other um, agreement if it's FOP destination FOP destination means that the seller still owns the goods until it reaches to the its destination so let's take uh, the same example of Zara so if Zara's factories at Spain agreed to sell uh, some goods to Zara's store at Egypt here and the agreement is for destination this means that uh, the goods is still owned by Zara's factory at Spain even if it didn't reach to Zara's factory in Egypt the second type of inventory that we need to consider is a type called goods and consignment let us first define what we mean by goods and consignment. These are goods kept and sold by someone else, not the owner, on behalf of the owner of the goods, in return for a commission. So, goods and consignment is considered part of the owner's inventory list. Let me give you an example in order to illustrate what we mean by goods and consignment. Assume that you have an online business in which you're going to make and sell cupcakes. In order to increase your sales, you agreed with one of your friends who have a store at Cairo Festival City to uh, sell the cupcakes that you make on your, on your behalf for a commission. So you is the one who produce the cupcakes. So you are the owner of the cupcakes. You are called the consigner. You are going to give the cupcakes, which is the inventory, to one of your friends who have a store. So this friend is called consignee. He's going to sell the cupcakes on your behalf in return for a commission. These goods owned by whom? By the one who produces it or the one who's going to sell it. According to this, those goods are owned by the one who's going to produce it. So the one who owns the good is the one who prepared it or the one who is going to make it. Only your friend is a consignee. He's going to sell the goods on your behalf in return for a commission that you're going to pay for him. So those goods should be included among the inventory list of the owner, which is the consigner. Okay, so uh, as this uh, PowerPoint illustrate, the consignee is the one who keeps the goods, but he doesn't own it. And he sell it on behalf of the owner or the consigner in return for a commission. The third type of goods that we need to uh, consider is called goods damaged or obsolete. Goods or obsolete damage are not counted in the inventory list. Let us first discuss what do we mean by damaged goods. Assume the same example of the cupcakes that I have a business and this business is specialized in making cupcakes. Assume that because of a bad storage condition, some of my cupcakes has been spoiled. So those spoiled goods are not part of my inventory list i'm going to exclude them from my inventory list so at the beginning of the day let's assume that i have prepared 100 cupcakes at the end of the day 20 of those cupcakes have been spoiled due to bad storage condition so accordingly i'm going to exclude those 20 cupcakes the spoiled cupcakes out of the 100 cupcakes that i prepared at the beginning of the day so at the end of the day, I'm going to have valid or good cupcakes that can be consumed equal to the difference, which is 80. So this is what I did now. I calculated the net realizable value of the goods or the net realizable uh, value of the cupcakes. I excluded the spoiled goods, the 20 out of the 100 out of the good goods. So this is the goods damaged or obsolete. They are not included as part of the inventory list. Of the owner so let us now refer to this exercise uh, which is direct application on the three types of inventory that we have been discussing 
Emma is a distributor of handmade gifts. At the end of the coin period, Emma looks over her inventory and finds that she has. You have three situations and you are required to fill in the blankets using the following keywords. Goods in transit, goods in consignment, and spoiled goods. Let us start by the first uh, situation. 1,300 units products in her basement, 20 of which were damaged by water and cannot be sold. The situation here, uh, we should refer to the 20 damaged products. As long as we have 20 damaged and cannot be sold, then we consider those as spoiled goods. So the first situation is fits the definition of a spoiled units. The second, 350 units in her van ready to deliver per customer order, terms FOB destination. So those are goods, those 350 units represents goods on their way to the buyer. So Emma now is the seller and agreed to deliver those 350 to the buyer. So the terms is FOB destination. So FOB destination means it belonged to Emma, it belonged to the seller until it received to the buyer destination. So those 30, uh, 350 units, we consider them goods in transit and they are still owned by Emma. They are still owned by the seller because the agreement is FOB destination. Third, 80 units out and placed at one of her friends who owns a retail store. Those 80 units represent goods in consignment. So Emma gave those 80 units to one of her friends who owns a retail store in order to sell them on, on Emma's behalf in return for a commission. So those 80 units represents goods on consignment. Okay, let's now complete the second requirement in this exercise. You're required uh, to calculate how many units should Emma include in her company's period, period and inventory. So let us start by the first number, which was one 300 units owned by Emma, and they are placed in her basement. However, 20 of them were damaged by water and cannot be sold. If you remember, we said that goods that are spoiled should be excluded from the rest of the goods. Accordingly, we are going to include the 1300 in period and inventory of Emma after excluding the 20 damaged product. So the first will be we are going to exclude 20 out of the 1300. Then the second situation, the 350 units in her van ready to deliver per customer order terms for destination. Those 350 units, they represent goods in transit. However, before including them, among Emma's inventory list, we need to consider the shipping terms. Shipping terms here is FOB destination, which means that they are still owned by Emma, which is the seller, until they reach to the buyer's destination. Accordingly, till this moment, Emma can consider those 350 among her inventory list. So she's going to add the 350 to the 1300 minus the 20, the damaged good. And finally, the 80 units out and placed at one of her friends who owns a retail store, which is goods in consignment. We agree that goods in consignment, although they are not placed at Emma's store, they are placed at another store. However, they are still owned by Emma. So goods in consignment will be part of the Emma's inventory list. So we're going to add 80 as well. So after doing the calculations, Emma now can consider that she owns 1,720 units. Now let us move to the third learning objective on this lecture, which is how to compute the price of the inventory under perpetual system using the four methods of specific identification, FIFO, LIFO, and weighted average. However, before discussing this learning objective, I need to take you through this hypothetical example in order to understand what is this learning objective. So now, assume that you have a store. In this store, you are going to sell t-shirts. Each t-shirt, you're going to sell it for $5. So $5 here represent the sale price. And the cost of bringing those t-shirts to your store is given as follows. For the first t-shirt, it will cost you $1 to buy it and the second t-shirt, it will cost you $2 to buy it, and the third t-shirt, it will cost you 3 
price. So again, cost price is the cost to bring those t-shirts to your store. Then you're going to sell each one of them later for the customer for a higher price, which is $5 per t-shirt. So now you have this lady that came to your store and want to select the first t-shirt and going to buy it. So you need to ask yourself, what is the selling price, which is, will be five? What is the cost of goods sold, which will be one because she selected to buy the first t-shirt. So you gain how much or how much was your gross profit, which is four. So gross profit here is the difference between the selling price, which is five and the cost of goods sold, which is one. So the store, uh, it's gross profit out of selling the first t-shirt will be four dollars. This method we call specific identification. What is specific identification? It's easy to identify which t-shirts have been sold and sold for how much and it cost is how much. You can easily identify this. This method we call it in uh, accounting specific identification. This is one of the methods used to compute the cost of the inventory, the price of the inventory, in which you can easily identify which inventory item have, has been sold and has been sold for how much and its cost is how much. This is easy. The real challenge is imagine that you have a store in which you are going to sell thousands of t-shirts. Do you think it will be easy for you to find enough time and enough resources to track the selling price of those t-shirts and the cost of those t-shirts? Actually, this is not an easy task because you will not have enough resources, you will not have enough time to track the cost of each item sold and the selling price of each item sold. So what will happen? In this case, I cannot use the specific identification method to determine the cost of inventory. I in order to determine the cost of inventory. Those options are either FIFO, LIFO and weighted average. What are the FIFO? What are the LIFO? What are the weighted average? These are the assumptions that companies will have to make in order to calculate the cost of inventory. And again, you should ask yourself, why should company make an assumption? Because it's not easy always to follow the specific identification method. What is the specific identification method? Is to identify exactly each sold item will cost you how much and you sold it for how much. This is not an efficient way to use if you're going to sell daily maybe thousands of items. It's not easy. So company usually will have to make an assumption. Those assumptions are not related to reality. However, they will make it easy for the company to determine the cost of the inventory. So now we are going to discuss those three methods that will be considered as assumptions followed by company in order to determine the cost of inventory. The first one is called FIFO. As you can see, FIFO stands for first in, first out. This is an assumption that the company will make. It will assume that the first unit arrived at the store will be the first unit that will be sold. So, as I'm referring here to this uh, example, this man came to the store and he wants to buy the second t-shirt, which will cost the company $2. So, here under FIFO, I'm going to ignore what will take place in reality. I'm going to ignore what the customer will actually buy. I'm going to follow my assumption, which is first in, first out. I'm going to assume that the first t-shirt, which was for $1, its cost was $1, will be the one that will be sold. Accordingly, the revenue is $5. We assume that each t-shirt will be sold for $5. Its cost of goods sold will be one because I'm ignoring what is taking place in reality. I'm not considering the customer desire. I'm considering my assumption that I'm assuming that the first t-shirt, which cost the company $1, will be the one that will be sold first. So I'm going to consider the cost of goods sold is one. And to calculate the gross profit for the company, I'm going to subtract the cost of goods sold, which is one, from the revenue, which is five. So the company will earn gross profit equal to four. So under this method, I'm assuming that the first unit arrived to the store will be the first unit that will be sold. This is what is FIFO about. 
uh, actually I'm ignoring what will take place in reality so as I'm referring here in this exercise in reality the customer won the second t-shirt not the first one and the second t-shirt will cost the company two dollars and not one I'm ignoring this completely I'm following my assumption which is that the customer will I'm assuming that he will buy the first t-shirt which is cost the company one dollar Now let us discuss the second assumption, which is LIFO. LIFO stands for last in, first out. So here I'm making an assumption that the last unit brought into the store, the last t-shirt brought into the store will be the first one that will be out, will be the first one that will be sold. Again, I'm ignoring what's taking place in reality. So here, the customer actually want to get the second t-shirt. I don't care. When I'm following this assumption, I don't care about what will take place in reality. I'm making my assumption that the last t-shirt brought in, which is the third t-shirt, is the first one that will be sold. So to calculate my gross profit, I will have to consider the revenue, which is the selling price. I'm selling each t-shirt for $5, so the revenues will be 5 And the cost of goods sold will be the cost of the last t-shirt, which was which was $3. So when subtracting $3 from the 5, which is the selling price, you're going to get gross profit equal to 2. And now the third assumption, we call it weighted average method. So here, under weighted average method, we consider the cost price to be the average cost price. So here, the first t-shirt will cost the company $1, the second t-shirt will cost the company two dollars and the third t-shirt will cost the company three dollars so their average will be one plus two plus three will be six dollars over their numbers which is three t-shirts so this means that on average each t-shirt will cost the company two dollars so here i am considering the average cost so Again, I'm ignoring what the customer wants to buy. Here, the customer wants to buy the third t-shirt. I'm ignoring this and I'm following my assumption, which is the average cost. So, the average cost here is calculated to be $2. I would subtract the cost of goods sold from the selling price, which is 5 So, I will get at the end gross profit equal to $3. And now after we discussed those three assumptions, which was the five for life on weighted average, let us return back to the heading of the learning objective. We said that on the third learning objective of the lecture, we need to determine how to calculate the cost of inventory under perpetual system using the four assumptions of specific identification, five for life on weighted average. So let us remember together what was the inventory system. We had two inventory system, which was perpetual system and periodic system. If you remember perpetual system, this is a system kept by the company to keep record of the inventory. If the, if the company is following the perpetual system, that, this means that the company will update its inventory record on a daily basis, continuously, after each purchase is made and after each sale is made. So it will not wait till uh, the end of the month to update its, its inventory record but alternatively it will do this update after each purchase is made and after each sale is made this is the perpetual system or a continuous system of updating the inventory the second one is periodic system periodic system this is more traditional this means that the company will count its inventory only once at year end or at the end of the month so it will not update the inventory regularly on a daily basis no but it will do this update only at the end of the month or the end of the year this is what we call periodic system so in this lecture we are going to learn to discuss the four ways to determine the cost of inventory which we discussed on the previous four slides the specific identification the first in first out which is the FIFO last in first out which is the LIFO and weighted average under perpetual system and on the next lecture which will be lecture six, we are going to discuss the same four methods, but under the periodic system. Let us now discuss how can we determine the cost of an inventory under perpetual system. Under each one of the four methods that we have learned 
uh, to differentiate between them, which are the specific identification, LIFO, FIFO, and weighted average. Uh, what you have to know that under each one of these methods, you will be required to determine the cost of two items. The cost of the ending inventory that will appear on the balance sheet, and the cost of the goods sold, which is an expense item, which will be appearing in the income statement. So, before we go to the uh, numerical example, I would like to uh, make a summary of all the equations that we are going to use in this uh, practical part. First, you need to know how you to calculate the cost of goods sold. If you remember, the cost of goods sold is the cost of the items that have been sold by the company. So to determine the total cost of goods sold, you should multiply the number of units sold times its cost price. And to know the cost of ending inventory, you will have to multiply this time the number of ending inventory times the cost price. Number of ending inventory can be given using different names, either number of units on hand or number of units left, or the remaining n units, all have the same meaning. So to know the cost of ending inventory, you will multiply the number of ending inventory units times the cost price. And finally, in order to get the ending inventory balance, if you don't have the number of units remaining and you don't have the cost price, there is another way that you can get ending inventory. In this case, ending inventory will be the difference between the total goods available for sale, which we refer it to total goods in, less total goods out, which is the cost of goods sold. So if you subtracted the sold units from the total units available at the beginning of the day, you will get, you will get the ending inventory at the end of a certain day. And the last rule that you will need to use will be how to calculate the selling revenues. The sales revenues is simply the total number of units sold times the selling price. Please uh, memorize these four equations because you will need to use them throughout this lecture. So let us start by discussing the first method, which is the specific identification. We mentioned that specific identification is not an assumption because if a company will use the specific identification, it will know exactly which item was sold and was sold for how much. So here there's no assumption. I'm following what actually took place in reality. So if I'm going to use the specific identification, this means that each item in the inventory will be matched with its specific purchase price and a specific selling price. So the specific identification method use the specific cost of each unit of inventory to determine the ending inventory and to determine the cost of goods sold. In the specific identification method, again, the company knows exactly which item was sold and exactly what the item cost. This costing method is best for businesses that sell unique, easily identified inventory items, such as automobile, uh, maybe uh, a jewelry, a real estate, something that's unique that I can identify easily its cost and its selling price. Let us now refer to the exercise. This exercise, you have a company, Trey Monson, starts a merchandising business on December 1st and enters into the following four inventory transactions. So you have four days. On each day, you have certain transactions that took place. So on December 7th, the company purchased 10 units. Each cost $6. As you can see, I'm analyzing the transactions row by row. So I started by December 7th. Then on December 14th, the company also purchased 20 units, additional 20 units, each for $10. Then on the third day, on December 15th, the company this time sold, didn't purchase, but sold 15 units each for $20. And on the last day, on December 21st, the company purchased additional units, 15 units each for 14 cost price. So you are required under perpetual inventory system. In the exam, I will be clear whether to use the perpetual or periodic. This lecture is about the perpetual. Next lecture will be about the periodic. You are required each time to calculate cost of goods sold and ending inventory 
under each of the four valuation methods, which were the specific identification, FIFO, LIFO, and weighted average. For the specific identification, you if you know that the business knows that the units sold, eight units are from December 7th purchase, and seven units are from December 14th purchases. So now the business determine exactly the sold units were obtained from which day. So in the exam, whenever you are required to prepare uh, cost of goods sold and any inventory under a specific identification method, you should draw this table. As you can see, this table consists of four columns. In the first table, we are going to insert the date of transaction. In the second column, we are going to insert the cost of goods purchased. Third column, we are going to insert the cost of goods sold. And on the fourth and last column, we are going to insert the difference between the cost purchased and the cost sold, which will be the cost of any inventory or what's remaining. So we need now to start to analyze the above given table in which we have dates. Those dates, we have certain transactions happened, either purchases or sale. And on each date, you have the number of units purchased and purchased for how much or the number of units sold and sold for how much. So we are going to start to analyze row by row. So first we have on December 1st, uh, excuse me, on December 7th. So this is the first transaction as highlighted. What happened? The company purchased 10 units. Each unit was purchased for $6. So we are going to first in the uh, empty table that we have below, we are going to insert the date. On the first row, we have December 7th. Then we should ask ourselves, what happened? Purchase or sale? It's given that it's a purchase. So we are going to write under the column of the purchases, the number of units purchased, it's given by 10. Each one purchased for six. So we multiply to get the total. We will multiply 10 units times $6. So we'll get $60. This is the cost of goods purchased. Then on the same date, there is nothing sold, so we are going to insert zero under the column of goods out. And now we have the remaining ending inventory, which in this case will be the difference between the goods purchased on December 7th and the goods sold on December 7th. So we don't have so anything sold, we only have goods purchased. So the remaining ending inventory will equal to the cost of goods purchased. So we will write down 10 units left and those 10 units each, its cost was $6, so we have in total $60. Then we will start to analyze the second date. So we will go up to the given table. We have the second uh, day, date we have is uh, December 14th, as you can see. What happened on December 14th is the purchases. So again, we are going to go to the table and insert December 14th, which is the date of the transaction. Then we have purchases, so we are going to write down the data under the column of purchases. How many units we have purchased? It's given here by 20 units. Each were purchased for $12. So we are going to write down this under the column of purchased. We're going to multiply the 20 units times the $12 to get the total cost of goods purchased, which will be 240. Then nothing sold on that date. So we will write zero under the column of goods out. And the difference which will be the remaining inventory or the ending inventory will be the difference between goods in and goods out. There's nothing out, only in. So I'm going to include the goods in as the remaining inventory. However, you need to take care of something here that on December 14th, we are counting the inventory left up till December 14th, meaning we are not considering only ending inventory on December 14th. No, we are considering the ending inventory on December 7th and on December 14th. So we are going to write down the ending inventory left from the day before, which is December 7th, plus the ending inventory left on December 14th. So we have 10 units times six. Those, let me highlight it for you. Those were remaining from transactions that took place on December 7th. And addition to that, we have extra 20 units purchased on December 14th, each for $12. So we have equal to 240. Their total would be 
dollars. So this is the total cost of ending inventory up till December 14. So not only on December 14, no, we are counting up till December 14. Okay, then we go up to the above table to analyze the third date. We have on December 15th, this time it's a sale. So we are going to write down December 15th and we are going to write under, this time under the column of sale, which is the goods out. So we have to write zero under goods in because nothing purchased on December 15th, only sold. So this time we have 15 units sold as uh, given in, in the above table, this 15 units. Each was sold for 20 selling price. So now under the specific identification method, you should be aware that the company, if she will use if it will use the specific identification method, this means that it can specifically identify which unit was sold and sold for how much and the cost of those units sold. So this is given here as an extra information, as you can see. If you know that eight units, if you know that of the units sold, out of the units sold, eight units are related to the seventh, December 7th purchase and seven units are from December 14th purchase. Why this information is given? Because now we can identify eight units out of seven December 7th purchases. So I can return back to December 7th purchases to know how much the cost of those eight units. So when I'm going to return back to December 7th, I will get $7 cost per unit. So when I'm going to write down this under the goods out, column on December 15, I will include the first eight units. Those eight units are coming from December 7th. So their cost is $6. So I'm going to multiply them by $6. So they are related to each other. So eight units times $6, we will get 48. And then I'm going to complete the rest. We have seven units are from 14th purchases, 14th of December purchases. So I'm going to take seven units. Those seven units are coming from which date? Are coming from December 14. So they are coming from this date. So I can track their cost. So their cost is $12. So I'm going to take this $12 here. So this means it's equal to 84. So when I want to get the total, so I want to add the 48 plus the 84, so I will get the total of cost of goods sold 132. And please remember that when you're going to calculate the cost of goods sold, you will multiply the units sold times the cost price, not the selling price. We are going to ignore the selling price. Selling price is only used when you're going to calculate sales revenues. So here we are calculating the cost of goods sold. Cost of goods sold is, is the result of units sold times the cost price. So then we will going to continue December 15. So we need to know the ending inventory. So we need now to know the amounts of units left after December 15th sale. So, out of the 10 units that we got on December 7th, we have 8 units sold. So, the remaining is 2 units, as you can see. Those 2 units, their cost price is 2 because they are coming from December 7th, so their total cost is 12. Then, out of the 20 units, purchased on December 14th, seven units worth sold. This means that we have three units remaining, 13 units, excuse me, remaining. Those 13 units, their cost is $12. So when I want to calculate the total cost will be $156. So to get the total cost of ending inventory, I will add the $12 to the $156. So I will get $168. So that was related to December 15th. Then we'll start to discuss the last date. So we will turn back to the above table. We have on December 21st, we have purchases. 
How many purchased? 15 units. Each purchased for 14 cost price dollar. So we are going to write down the date, December 21st. And we're going to write 15 units, total units purchased. Each were purchased for 14, so we'll get 210. Then I have nothing sold, so I will put zero. Then I want to know the remaining units up till December 21st, not only on December 21st. So I will take the ending inventory remaining from December 15, which was two units times $6, and 13 units times 12. Those are coming from December 15, as you can see. And I will add to them the new purchased item that was done on December 21st. So I will add those 15 units that were additionally purchased on December 21st to the ending inventory on December 21st day. So to get their total, I will get total ending inventory up till December 21st equal to 378 dollars. And now the last row in the color in this table is to get the total cost of goods sold which is 132 and the total cost of ending inventory which will be 378. So I as you can see when I get the total ending inventory I will get the figure that was used on December 21st because the figure that was used on December 21st include all the previous transactions. Now, after we finished the first method of determining the cost of ending inventory and the cost of goods sold, which was a specific identification, let us discuss the second method, which is the first in, first out, or we use the initial of FIFO. So, under this uh, method, the company assumes that the first unit purchased will be the first unit sold. So, it assumes that inventory items are sold in the same order acquired. So, the first units acquired will be the first unit sold. So, this means that the cost of goods sold under the FIFO method will include the cost of the oldest units purchased. This means that the first units to come in are assumed to be the first units to go out or to be sold. And also this means that the remaining units or the units left in the ending inventory will be the cost of the most recent purchased units. So let us now practice the FIFO. We have the same example that we had when we solved the specific identification. We have the same transactions and the same company. And we are required to calculate also the cost of goods sold and the ending inventory cost. So we are going to draw the same table that includes the four columns, the dates, the cost of goods in, which is the purchase, the cost of goods out, which are the sold, and the difference between them, which is the cost of any inventory. We'll start to analyze date by date or row by row. So on December 7th, the company purchased 10 units each with $6. So we are going to insert this under the column of goods in and we don't have anything sold so we will write zero and the ending inventory in this case will be the same as the goods in because there is nothing sold. Then we will start the second date on December 14th so the company purchased additional 20 units each with $12 cost price. So we write down this under the column of goods in, 20 units times $12, so we will get $240. Nothing sold, so we will insert zero. And the left units on that date will be the left units from previous dates plus on December 14th. So we will consider 10 units times 6, which were those related to December 7th transaction, plus the additional one that was purchased on December 14th, which were 20 units times $12, so it's equal to 240 units. Their total would be 300. Then we will start on December 15th, the third date, sale, 15 units, each sold for $20 selling price. 
So on that date, now the company decided to sell units, 15 units. Uh, now we are under the FIFO assumption, which assume that those 15 units comes from purchased will be the first unit sold. The first means the oldest units. So the oldest units here is on December 7th. So I will take December 7th units, which were 10 units, and I will take them with their cost, which were six. So I will refer to December 7th because this is the oldest units. I will take all these 10 units times their cost, which will equal to 60. However, I still need more five units because the total sold units were 15. I only took 10 units from December 7th. So I still need five units from the next date, which will be on December 14th. So out of those 20 units, I will take more five units with their cost price, which is $12. So I will get $60. So the order is I move from the oldest date and then the next date. So I will start first by the oldest date, which is December 7th. I only had on December 7th 10 units. However, I sold 15, so I need more 5 units. So I will move to the next date, which is December 14th. Out of the 20, I will take 5. So I will take those 5 with their cost, which is $12, so I will get 60. So, the total cost of goods sold on December 15th was $120. Then, I need to know the end of inventory. So, all the units that purchased on December 7th were sold. So, I have nothing left from December 7th. So, all what is left will be coming from December 14th. As you can see, I had 20 units and I sold from them five units so the remaining is 15 units those 15 units their cost is 12 so i had total cost of ending inventory equal to 180 which was on december 15th then the last day which will be december 21st i had purchases equal to 15 units times 14 cost price each unit so I will include this under the column of goods in. I have nothing sold, so I will put zero under the column of goods out. And the remaining units up till December 21st. So I will take all the previous ending units first. So I have from December 15, I have 15 units. Uh, each cost 12. I have those. So I will include them on December 21st plus all the units that were purchased on December 21st they were remaining I didn't sell any of them so they will be remaining so I will include them as well with their cost price and I will get their total which will be in this case 390 last step is to get the total totals here will be the total of goods purchased, which will be 60. Let me highlight for you, which will be $60 plus the $240 plus the $210. So I will get the total cost of goods purchased during a certain <clears throat> period, which will be 510. Goods sold, I have only one goods sold, one transaction, which was on December 15th. So I will include it, as you can see, those 120. And finally, the cost of ending inventory, I will take the total cost of ending inventory on December 21st because on that date, it includes all the previous ending inventory. So it will equal to 390. So now let's discuss the third method used to assign cost to ending inventory and to the unit sold, which is called LIFO or last in first out. Under this method, the company assumes that the last, the most recent units brought into the company will be the first unit sold. So the cost of goods sold will always include the cost of the most recent units purchased. 
while the remaining units or the cost of ending inventory will include the cost of the oldest units. So let us discuss this through a numerical example. We have here the same data that will be used in the, in the specific identification and the FIFO. We are going to draw the same table and we're going to start to analyze date by date or row by row. On December 7th, we have 10 units purchased, each for $6. So we are going to include this under the column of goods in. Then we have nothing sold, so we'll include zero. And ending inventory will be the difference between the goods in on that date and the goods out on that date. So there is nothing out. So all will be the ending inventory. All the goods in will be the ending inventory. 10 units times $6, which will be 60. Then when we start on December 14th, we have another purchases for 20 units, additional units purchased, each for 12, equal to 240. So we're going to place this under the goods in column. Nothing were sold, so we we'll include zero. And the left ending inventory on December 14th will be total ending inventory up till December 14th. So we will include those of December 7th, which will be 10 units times $6, which will be 60, plus the additional 20 units purchased on December 14th times $12, which will be 240. Their total cost, the total cost of ending inventory up till December 14th will be 300. Then we'll start on December 15th sale of 15 units. So we will write zero under goods in because we purchased nothing on December 15th, but actually we sold 15 units. Now we are under LIFO. So LIFO assume what? The most recent, the most newest units purchased in will be the first sold. So here we have two dates before December 15th. We have December 14th and December 7th. Which one is the newest date, is the most recent one, will be December 14th. So I'm going to withdraw the units sold from December 14th. So I will take those 15 units from the newest date, which is December 14th. So I will include them, 15 units, times their cost price, which will be $180. And now let's count what's left. What's left? is out of the 15 units, out of the 20 units that I acquired on December 15, I sold 15 units. So five units is remaining. The remaining with their cost, which is $12, which is equal to 60. And don't forget that also you have remaining units left from December 7th. You still didn't sell them. So we should include them as well. So I'm going to include the 10 units times $6 in the ending inventory on December 15. So to get the total cost of goods sold on December 15, I will total them, which is will equal to $120. Now I have the last date, which is December 21st. I purchased additional 15 units for $14 cost price. So I will include it under the column of goods in. I sold nothing, so I will put zero. And now I need to consider the cost of ending inventory up till December 21st. So I will repeat the same numbers that I had on December 14. I will repeat them here on December 21st, as you can see. And I will add to them as well the purchases that I made on December 21st, those one. I will include them as well among the cost of ending inventory on December 21st. So I will get a total cost of ending inventory equal to $330. And the last thing is to get the total goods in, goods out, and ending inventory. You have the only goods out $180, and the cost of ending inventory will be the December 21st, which will be $330. Now the last method of assigning cost to the ending inventory and cost of goods sold is called the weighted average. Under the weighted average method, the company will assign cost to the goods sold and to the ending inventory based on a cost that's called average cost or weighted average cost per unit. 
when your average cost is per unit is calculated using this rule, which is the cost of goods available for sale at the time of sale, divided by units on hand at the date of sale. So, to make it more clear, let us move to the exercise in order to understand more how can we apply this rule. So, let us start to apply using the same data that we had on the previous three methods. We are going to draw the same table and we will start by on December 7th, we have purchases of 10 units times $6 each, so we will get $60. This is the total cost of goods purchased on December 7th. Then I have nothing sold, so I'll put zero. And the left units will be the co cost of goods in because there is nothing sold, so all the goods in will be remaining at the end of the day. Then I will start the second date, which is on December 15th. I purchased 20 units, each times $12, so I will get to $40. I still didn't sell anything, so I will include zero under the column of goods out. And the left will be both in the inventory, left in from December 7th and from December 14th. So I will include both of them as cost of ending inventory. So then I will start on December 7th. Uh, sorry, on December 15th, it's given that the company sold units, 15 units, each for 20 selling price. Now, I will include on December 15th, so those sold units under the column of goods out. So, I will include 15 units. However, I need to calculate their cost. So, under the weighted average, we are not concerned with the number of units sold, we will take the number of units sold as it is and put it under the column of goods out. However, we are more concerned about their cost. How can we calculate the cost? The cost will be what we call the weighted average. What is the weighted average cost per unit? Which will be the total cost of goods available on hand divided by the total units available on hand. So, we are going to calculate this by standing on December 14th and calculate the total units available on hand, which will be the 10 units plus the 20. So we'll get 30 units. Their cost is 60 plus 240, which is 300. So we need to know the average cost per unit. So we are going to divide the $300 by the 30 units. So this means that on average, each unit will cost me $10. This $10 is the product of the $300 divided by the 30 units. So this is the average cost that I will consider when I need to calculate the cost of goods sold on December 15th. So I will move to December 15th. I will include zero under goods in because I didn't purchase anything on that date but rather I sold 15 units. So I will put under the sold those 15 units, but this time I will use the average cost that I have calculated on December 14th. So I multiply those 15 units times the $10, the average cost, so I get 150. And I will ask myself, out of those 30 units, how many units left? I will get 15 units left, and I will multiply them also by the average cost, so which will be $10, so I will get $150. And then on the last date, I have 15 units purchased, so I will include them on December 21st. I will have 15 units purchased, each for 14, so it's equal to 210. Nothing sold, so I put zero under the goods out. And then the units left up till December 21st, I will include those left from December 15th plus the additional units that I acquired on December 21st. I didn't sell any of them, so they will be also included in the ending inventory. So this will be 15 units times their cost price, which is 14, so it's equal to 210. So at the end, I will have 150, this is the total cost of goods sold, and 360, the total cost of any inventory.
Now we need to compare between the four methods that we will use to assign cost to any inventory and cost of units sold. So we will refer to requirement B on exercise two, which is calculate the gross margin the net income, given that the selling general and administrative expenses were equal to $50. So we will have this table, as you can see, we have the SI method, which is the specific identification method, FIFO, which is the first in, first out, LIFO, which is the last in, first out, WA, which is the weighted average. We will compare the net income among the four methods. So, first, we need to calculate the sales. As you know, in order to calculate sales, we need to multiply the selling price times the unit sold. And please remember that selling price doesn't differ among the four methods. The four methods is different with regard to the cost price. Each method has its own cost price. However, the selling price will be the same among the four methods. So, referring back to the exercise that we solved on the previous slides, we had 15 units sold on December 15th. Each were sold for $20, which is the selling price. So, to calculate sales, we will multiply the 15 units sold on December 15th times the selling price given by $20, so we'll get $300. This $300 will be the same even if the company used specific identification, FIFO, LIFO, or weighted average, as you can see. Then, the second thing that will be the same among the four methods will be the selling general and administrative expenses that's given above here. This is the same figure among the four methods, which is the $50. So I will put them in the table, as you can see, between brackets, because they will be subtracted from the gross margin. Then I will start to fill in the remaining numbers. Now we need to know the cost of goods sold. Please refer back to the slides where we solved the specific identification method. You will get the total cost of goods sold, which will equal to $132. You will subtract the $132 from the $300, the sales, so you will get gross margin equal to $168, less the $50, the selling general administrative expenses, so you will get net income equal to $118. We will do the same in the rest methods. Under FIFO, please refer back to the slides where we solve the FIFO table and use the cost of goods sold figure, which will equal to $120. You will subtract it from the sales revenue, so we'll get gross margin equal to $180. Subtract then the selling general and administrative expenses, so we'll get $130 net income. Then LIFO, the cost of goods sold, which was calculated on the LIFO slide, was equal to $180. You're going to subtract it from the sales, you will get $120 gross margin, less $50 selling expenses, so we'll get net income to $70. And finally, the weighted average. Cost of goods sold, please refer to the slides where we solve the weighted average. You will get the cost of goods sold number, which is $150. You will subtract it from the sales, so we'll get gross margin equal to $150. And then finally, subtract the selling expenses, you will get $50. This means that the net income, according to the weighted average method, will be $100. Now, after we calculated the net income under the four methods, you are required to complete the following in order to make a comparison between the four methods. Let's start by C, requirement C. The first one, which method assign the lowest amount to the cost of goods sold, yielding the highest gross profit and net income? So you need to refer back to the table that you have here and to compare between the cost of goods sold among the four methods. Which one has the lowest number of cost of goods sold? This would be the FIFO. So the answer is FIFO. This means what? Under FIFO, the cost of goods sold will be the least number compared to the four methods. That's because of what? Because of the assumption that FIFO is based on. If you remember, FIFO is based on the assumption that first unit brought in will be the first unit sold. So usually the first units brought in was, will be the oldest unit, so they are purchased with a lower price compared to the recent units that were purchased later. 
because as you know as time go prices will go up so if I purchased unit two days ago I will purchase so first in first out always the cost of goods sold will be the lowest am amount among the four methods this will make the net income as you can see the highest which is 130 right. then the second one which method assign the highest amount to cost of goods sold so refer back to the cost of goods sold again and look for the highest amount of cost of goods sold you can see that this is LIFO as I can highlight for you now this is the highest amount of cost of goods sold so this would be LIFO so we need to know why LIFO assigned the highest amount to the cost of goods sold this is because of the assumption which LIFO is based on if you remember LIFO is based on assumption that the last items purchased will be the first item sold so usually the items that is purchased today will be more priced than the items that was purchased two or three days or one year ago so this will make always the cost of goods sold under LIFO the highest amount then third requirement which results give gives which method gives results between FIFO and LIFO so if you look at FIFO and LIFO numbers so it's here 130 and 70 we will know that in the middle we have weighted average and specific identification this is in the middle between FIFO and LIFO However, as we agreed before, specific identification is not an assumption, but actually it's based on what takes place in reality. It means under the specific identification, based on what the customer will buy, I'm going to assign the cost to the units purchased and the units sold. So the method that gives the results in the middle between FIFO and LIFO will be the weighted average. And finally, which result that depend on which units are sold, this would be the specific identification. Because under specific identification, I can exactly know which unit was sold and sold for how much. So, which method the company should use? Uh, any of these four methods are acceptable by the accounting principles. However, accounting principles states that if the company goes for one method it should, it should use this method from one year to another this is in order to fulfill a concept that's called consistency concept so consistency concept mean that the company should be consistent with regard to the method that it will use in calculating its cost of ending inventory and the cost of goods sold from one year to another so if on um, for instance, here to Southern 18, the company decided to use FIFO, then it should use FIFO in 2019, 2020, and forever until there is something that happened that will make the company, force the company to change to another method. So if this happened, it is acceptable to change the method. However, there should be a valid reason, and the company must write down that in its financial statement. So it's not acceptable to switch from one method to another across the year unless there is a valid reason happen that will make the company change. Regarding the tax effect of costing methods, the Internal Revenue Service, which is the tax authority in USA, identifies several acceptable inventory costing methods for reporting taxable income. One of those acceptable methods will be the LIFO. So, if the life will be used for tax purposes, then it should be also used for accounting purposes. If you remember before, we mentioned that tax rules or tax authority has different rules, different from the accounting rules. So usually a company will prepare two financial statements. One financial statement in order to apply with the accounting rules, another financial statement to apply with the tax rules. So 
Under the costing methods that we discussed today, if the company will use a certain tax um, costing method, tax and costing method, such as LIFO, then it should use LIFO when it will prepare its financial statement for the accounting purposes and also when it prepare for the tax declaration form. So, now we will come to the end of lecture 5 in which we discussed the four different methods used to assign the cost to any inventory and cost of goods sold under the perpetual system. Thank you for listening.